Esperamos que hayáis disfrutado de la primera Inspirational Talk. Son las dos en punto. Nos ponemos ya con la siguiente sesión. Está enmarcada en el Visions Project y vamos a hablar de los proyectos principales de las zonas económicas para apoyar a las compañías y generar empleo. Antes ya hemos estado hablando de algunos de los retos de las zonas económicas de Europa, de Oriente Medio. Ahora lo que vamos a hacer es eh, fijarnos en tres significativas zonas económicas también de Oriente Medio, pero de América también, para explicar cuáles son sus proyectos bandera en los, próximos, en los próximos diez años y que van a tener como objetivo mantener su consolidación como líderes del sector. Para ello vamos a tener a Juan Pablo Rivera, a Carlos Honfay y también a James Bernard, que lo están viendo aquí a mi lado. Los otros dos invitados los eh, ven detrás, eh, están online y volvemos a contar con Corny Finger, que nos va a moderar esta, este panel ahora hasta las 3 de la tarde. Corny, thank you for being here again. It's all yours. Thank you very much and thank you for allowing me to lead this session. This will give us a great chance after having discussed in previous sessions some of the, the macro trends that are driving FDI activity and they're impacting zones and talking about some of the challenges that zones have to navigate as we work our way um, into recovery and out of crisis. This session will give us a chance to hear in a bit more detail what three successful zones are doing in order to achieve those aims and, and in order to build resiliency and, and to set the basis for continued success going forward, and what projects and initiatives they have on offer. I'm looking forward to hearing about those. Um, we have with us, as you heard, Carlos Wong. He is the general director of Coil Free Zone in Costa Rica. Juan Pablo Rivera is the president of Bogota Free Zone in Colombia. James Bernard is the head of Europe for DMCC, so representing a Dubai zone in Europe. All three of these zones, I think we can, we can objectively say, are successful zones. And in fact, all three have been awarded by our recently announced Investment Monitor Economic Zone Sustainable Recovery Award. So congratulations to all of the zones that impressed the judges with their plans for recovery. COIL, in fact, is our overall winner for these inaugural awards. So congratulations, Carlos. And we'll start with you. Now, a key, a key ingredient to success is continuity, but obviously continuity is very difficult at a time of turmoil. So how do you go about being able to navigate through this difficult time and keep continuity in terms of your inward investments, but also help the businesses that are operating in your zone have continuity themselves? Oh, thank you, Courtney, not only for the participation in this panel, but also for uh, being instrumental in the award that Coyol has received. I think that the first point is to create a background on why we are where we are. The first point is about related to our expansion. We expanded more than 80,000 square meters in Costa Rica in the last year. More than 40% of our customer expanded and we increased even so we were in the middle of the pandemic the jobs generated by our free zone on more than 1,500 new jobs. Also, our exports increased it almost 22% from our park. And those achievements were being uh, able to be accomplished because the most important point that we had was a significant business continuity. In the middle of the pandemic, the most uh, important struggle is how to continue doing business in the middle of the important challenges, not only from the health point of view, but also from the logistics point of view. So the challenges regarding continuity were related to people and were related also to the logistics and global change. Uh, in that regard, basically what we did is a significant uh, support to our community in Costa Rica, we worked very strongly with the Costa Rica government in order for school to be awarded has essential activity so that allowed the people to continue being able to work. So we worked also very importantly with the transportation system because the mobility was significant because it was significantly reduced. So we put a lot of emphasis in how to move the people. So we put uh, a lot of sanitary measures for our transportation system and we uh, put an effort on that and cooperate with the Costa Rica government in terms of the health system. 
we work in three main areas. The first area was in equipment and materials, where we donate a significant uh, amount of equipment and materials to the Costa Rica government in order to help the fight against the COVID. And also, we are right now working strongly on the vaccines. We have more than 10,000 vaccines applied in, in, uh, in, through the employees of our part. And we're putting almost about 90% of our employees are right now uh, fully vaccinated and also helping the health system in different uh, small ways, like concerts to our doctors and physicians, helping them to be in a better uh, con mental conditions. And in another important stage that we did was to transform our customer service and transform it into what we call digital training. We took our courses, we put them into a synchronic course and started providing digital training that people can take it even from their phones in order to be able to qualify for the medical devices industry, which is an industry that demands high qualified people. So those actions were very important in order to continue business during this uh, pandemia time. Thank, thank you very much. And you touch on a few things that we've been hearing a bit about today in our sessions, and, and one of them is the Im importance of digital initiatives, and I think we'll, we'll probably end up coming back to that. Uh, James, I'll turn to you. And first of all, thank you for joining here in person. It's great to have you here on the stage. Um, you're based in Holland, representing DMCC, one of the world's most reliably successful zones. What can you tell us about how the zone has coped with the crisis and, and what initiatives do you have that gives you a talking point as you engage European investors? Sure, well, thank you very much for having us uh, back here physically this time. We were part of the uh, BNU uh, initial inaugural uh, event last year, which was great as well. Um, I think to, to, to sort of just go back and give a little bit of history, we were created back in 2002 and we're a, a government, semi-government organization uh, we have three verticals, so free zone is by far the largest vertical we have, but we also have a uh, property development uh, vertical, whereby we've built the Jumeirah Lakes Towers, which you've, you've probably seen um, over the years develop, and we have, I think, over 70 towers there now, uh, light industry, uh, and we're building a development called Uptown now to fit in um, some more of the business as it, as it grows. Uh, and the third vertical is extremely important, but not so large, which is commodities and financial services. And these really represent the initiatives that we've driven over the past uh, years, um, going back all the way to 2004, whether it's gold, diamonds, tea, coffee, or these days crypto and blockchain, we've developed infrastructure, products and services to support those industry sectors. and. Um, and that's been vital to the growth of businesses in the region. We're home to now around 20,000 companies, mm -hmm. I think 100,000 people living and working within the free zone. It's a, it's a great style model of, of, a, of a sort of new age uh, economic zone, which is residential, commercial, retail, and light industry. And, um, and I think to answer your question, really, the, the ability to be able to react quickly to the situation, which was also happening last time we had the a conversation last year was um, was was of really high importance. We were managed to, we managed to um, adopt a different system. So we were already very very uh, digital. Um, we then were able to put 99% of our products and services licensing all the important stuff that companies have to do apart from their actual business. We managed to put that online, um, which meant we were able to attract companies from all over the world even during lockdown periods. And that sort of leads on to some of the important facts about why uh, and how business is and, and why it is as it is. Mm -hmm. And over the last 18 months, we've seen a, a real uptake in registrations of companies, new, new registrations of companies. And of course, there's been casualties, but there's also been growth in other companies, especially in the e-commerce sector, digital sectors that you mentioned, but also in pharmaceutical sectors and e-education, all these, all these other wonderful um, industries that there, are, that there are coming out of this, uh, this crisis. And what we found is a lot of companies who have been landlocked because of the lockdowns, the, the, 
the necessity of having a lockdown in several countries have meant that they couldn't get their products and services to their client. And that has brought to their attention and to the world's attention that people need to be more diversified and maybe set up in more uh, geographic locations. So it's not whether it's in South America only or, or Europe or America or, or Dubai. It's, it's uh, what suits you and what's going to make uh, sense to your business structure and protect you from where we go next in this, uh, in this scenario. Yeah, and that, that fits with a trend that had been running for a little while in FDI of more projects of a smaller size, so kind of fragmenting of, of FDI, and it seems that COVID has accelerated that. Yeah, in, in fact, over, you know, we have a coffee center. I'm, I'm sure you're gonna ask me I've about that in any I've enjoyed the coffee case. there. Um, <laughs> so the coffee center is a, uh, it's a facility that we built to accommodate anyone who wants to use it. So it has roasting facilities, mm -hmm. packaging, bagging, uh, cold brew, anything that a company would need to set up a coffee business in the region and target new clients. And in fact, during the, uh, some of the lockdown period uh, were the busiest times of the coffee center because of course mm -hmm. there were less shipments coming from other countries. And so the GCC really relied on that facility being there. So it just showed the importance of the work that we've been able to achieve and and we really support these industries. We don't try to interfere in the industry. Mm -hmm. We just find out where there's extra value to be added and, and support those. And that's an appropriate role, I think, for um, investment facilitators such as yourselves. I want to check in with Juan Pablo about what's going on in your zone in Bogota. I know that Bogota Free Zone has always placed quite a large emphasis on digitalization and creating efficiencies through use of technology. What have you got in the works now, and how has your approach changed post-crisis? Oh, we're not hearing you, Juan Pablo. Are you, is your mic on? Yes, it's already on. There we go. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Carney. Yes, uh, really, uh, it's been a uh, very important uh, what, what has happened uh, during this time for the Bogota Free Zone. As you know, we have a long history. We opened uh, our installations in 1997. Uh, and we have uh, moved from one sector to another and, and to have now 200 companies established as uh, users of the free zones and we have 200 more uh, giving support to these companies um, in order to make them operate properly and with the, all the conditions to be more competitive. Um, and you can imagine also that we, we also operate uh, within Colombia 40 free trade zones in addition to the Bogota free zone. So for us, uh, it was a big challenge to make sure that all these free trade zones were operating with this pandemic, the COVID-19 uh, uh, pandemic came into, into the scene. So uh, fortunately, uh, we were working some few months ago be or before the pandemic in order to digitalize our operation. And thanks to that, we can uh, con maintain and continue the operation of all these free trade zones around Colombia. We have uh, operations from the north part of the country to the south, to the east and west, uh, more than 200 people around, uh, making sure that the customs operations of these free trade zones uh, are reliable and comply with all the regulation. So it was a really great experience, thanks to this uh, digital um, transformation that we have been doing uh, within our, our system and, and our uh, procedures. Uh, we, we were able to maintain this uh, latter, huge uh, operation. We, we, we handle more than 200, uh, 400 thousand operations uh, per year in all these free trade zones uh, with a lot of uh, responsibilities. As you know, our uh, free trade zone regime is a little bit different than in many other countries. We have the North American model in which uh, the privates are the ones that are allowed to uh, permit the entry and exit of the merchandises into the free zone. So <clears> for us, <throat> it's very important to make sure that all that operates properly. Um, so uh, fortunately, uh, with this uh, digital transportation, we, we, we were able to operate all our free trade zones 
uh, due to the factor that main, uh, many of these free trade zones and, uh, and our users are in the health sector and or start producing, a, 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 let's say, a sanitary a products in order to help with this uh, pandemic. All the all the free trade zones were uh, able to maintain their operation. Uh, at the moment, uh, fortunately, we are already uh, back into the line of the number of operations and exports, imports, and number of employments that we had before the pandemic. And that's something that is very important for us and for for our country because the reactivation is uh, something that we're looking for. Um, the, all the, the, the economic measures uh, says that uh, this year we're going to, the country is going to grow 8.2% the GDP. So that's a very good news for, for the country. The unemployment that was very high, it got uh, up to 20% or so in, in some moments during the pandemic. At this moment, already we're uh, almost uh, getting to one digit unemployment. That's something that is very important for our country. So. Uh, we believe that uh, with this digitalization that the that we have done as, as many others of the free zones that are established in Colombia, um, we're contributing uh, in a very good pop, uh, manner uh, to the to the reactivation of the economy in Colombia. Thank so I, I think. Thank you. And yes, the zones have a crucial role to play in the global recovery. And, and a few things that you mentioned, such as the <coughs> digitalization, um, that means the zones through these digital activities and trainings that go on there have a role to play in upskilling the employees of the countries in which they operate and help the national economies move of course. the value chain. Is that a responsibility that you, that you take on actively? Yes, of course. Uh, we have a, a university within the free zone uh, in which uh, we maintain uh, all the all the all this uh, upskilling of the people in order to make sure that all of them were able to keep on with this digitalization. Uh, uh, there is a, an average of 1,500 people studying permanently in this uh, university within the zone and gave us the opportunity to do that particular upscaling and make sure that the digital transformation was uh, getting into the culture of all, of all the uh, companies within the free zone. Thank you. And, and Carlos, I'll return to you. Costa Rica is has been very successful in this moving up the value chain. It's been written a huge amount about um, the, the Intel investment years ago and how the country was able to leverage that and move into higher tech sectors. Where does the process take you next? What new sectors, new industries, uh, or even new technologies are you, are you gearing up for next? And how can you make sure um, that the employees are ready for those? The most important changes that Costa Rica is facing now is a significant growth in the value-added services. The value-added services has significant growth uh, through the last few years, particularly in areas like digital marketing, uh, web development, cybersecurity, by cloud services. So the, the new trends are based on value-added services. Are the less in the manufacturing area, particularly in the, in the medical devices industry, we continue to grow based on, on a significant diversification of the type of products and adding more value, especially with these products that integrate technology and integrate the simple medical device. So what we mean by that is the IoT is one of the areas that is also being integrated. So what the medical devices industry in Costa Rica is doing is not only producing products, producing also a, a significant uh, position for Costa Rica in terms of the exports through the world. So the logistics, and particularly being Costa Rica has a point where the products are made in Costa Rica and exported worldwide to more than 220 countries, make our country an important point for new products development. So research and development is a new area that is growing in Costa Rica. And the other area is 
support services for the medical devices industry. So what we're seeing is an integration between the value-added services and the manufacturing industry and also the logistics uh, positions in order to have a much, <clears throat> much more diversified and a strong cluster of medical devices in Costa Rica. Mm -hmm. So that's why we have uh, new projects that are coming for the expansion of Coyol Free Zone within the next few uh, months. Yeah, the di diversification um, is going to be crucial um, in terms of keeping that continuity and for zones to expand. So James, I want to come back to you. And when we're thinking around new technologies, obviously we, we need to discuss blockchain and crypto. And I know that's something that you're actively engaged with. How do you think blockchain and, and cryptocurrencies could be leveraged to help further develop zones? And how will they change the nature of FDI? Okay, great. Uh, interesting question. It's, um, I think we started back in 2014, 2015 with the uh, Global Blockchain Council in Dubai. And uh, really what that was, was uh, to look at what we could find out there to adopt uh, either in the private or uh, government sector to bring efficiencies to the way that we work. Mm -hmm. And that has gone on to be uh, proven and adopted in, in several um, several um, different devices, if you like. So K from KYC to company registration to uh, transfer of properties, all of these types of, um, I'd say, what used to be paper-based has now become digitized and uh, the blockchain and other distributed ledger technologies add credibility and reliability and, and safety to these um, transfers of uh, what is really value instead of um, knowledge. Mm -hmm. um, back in 2020, we were very lucky to be at Davos and we signed an agreement with Crypto Valley Venture Capital and CV Labs who are very successful companies in Switzerland who were instrumental in developing the Crypto Valley in, in Switzerland, in Zurg and Zurich. And we've teamed up with them and brought them into Amherst Tower and we have now have a crypto center in, in DMCC. Um, we always like to try and be forward thinking and the idea behind that was to support all types of industry from the blockchain, DLT, crypto, DeFi, NFT mm -hmm. space and to bring in all the various parts that would be integral to companies who were there operating out of Dubai mm -hmm. which was spurred on by the UAE's uh, Securities and Commodities Authority coming out with crypto asset regulation which then meant that we could sign an MOU with them and start licensing companies to carry out these activities in Dubai. Dubai is an incredibly, uh, and the UAE as a whole, is an incredibly um, popular place to work from these days. Uh, we saw that happening over the last couple of years. They handled the COVID crisis really, really well, and therefore we're able to maintain quite reasonable uh, open standards where people felt safe and could come in and they um, could adapt very quickly to, to, to adopt different measures when needed. So of course the crypto industry is, is an industry where people can and are globally located and a lot of those people chose to uh, move to Dubai during this period and we're lucky enough still to have them. So the crypto center is now, it's called crypto but it's, it's very much blockchain, DLT, um, the underlying technology behind other DeFi's and crypto, that's the most important bit for us. And I think now we're, we're over 100 companies in that sector and, and several hundred in the making. So I think that was one part of uh, what we did during the last couple of years that's been very, you know, a lot of luck, um, a lot of hard work and, and good partners. And I think partners are in, uh, is something I wanted to bring up because we don't try and do everything alone, and we always reach out to the industry, to other free zones, and try and use best in practice uh, methodology to create extra value and to attract companies. And I think that's why DMCC has been successful over the years, mm -hmm. maintaining those standards, the reliability, the, the um, balanced regulatory environment with the commercial environment that's required these days. It, it seems, especially when it comes to blockchain and, and crypto, the regulatory environment is essential and having regulators that are a bit forward thinking and in, in, in setting the groundwork for these kind of technologies to be deployed. Well, we think so, but 
if you talk to the industry itself, the, it's, uh, the sort of that's, that's divided because, <laughs> of course, it's a distributed industry, and the whole idea behind it is it's not over-regulated. But, of course, when it comes to protecting the individuals like you and I, mm -hmm. um, when we're buying crypto or we're using a DeFi product or NFT, then it's really important for us to have some sort of protection. Mm -hmm. And so companies around the world have, have realized this. Um, whether you're an exchange, crypto exchange, or whether you're a DeFi protocol, um, you are looking for a home. And that home, wherever it is, needs to have a regulatory environment that your client, your end client, is going to be satisfied with for your business to be able to succeed. And that's what the UAE saw very early on. Um, it's not easy. It's really uh, complex to try and understand all of these new technologies and the bits and pieces that go into it and where it crosses over into the financial regulatory environment. Mm -hmm. uh, but they've been very forward thinking and fast to adopt regulations. And those regulations should be coming out um, and turned into licenses mm -hmm. sometime this year still. OK, exciting still to come. Something to keep an eye on. I want to ask um, Carlos and, and Juan Pablo, first of all, is is blockchain and, and crypto, do you have initiatives related to that? Is that something on your radar, or do you not see as important at this point for your strategies? I'll start with Juan Pablo. Well, Kearney, actually, um, is not part of our strategy uh, in this moment, uh, and it's something that is... Uh, that is not operating actually in, in Colombia. Let's say you can you can buy and sell through some uh, uh, application that you can get into, but it's not something that is particularly strongly uh, um, empowered in Colombia at the moment. Mm -hmm. Is that the same for Costa Rica? Yes, we have a similar situation as in Colombia. Uh, the crypto regulations are just in the process of analysis by the Costa Rican authorities. And I think that we are at this moment mu much more focused on, on cloud works and all these kind of relations than, uh, than on crypto. Okay. I, I would sort of add to that. And of course, it's taken a long time for the UAE to look at these regulations and look at what everyone else is doing. Um, crypto has been bucketed together with blockchain and DLT naturally because uh, it's the underlying um, technology for Bitcoin, mm -hmm. but it's a very different product and it brings with it a lot of benefits. And um, we're not focusing on the crypto side of it, even though our, our um, center is called the Crypto Center. It's really cryptographic. So it's the underlying nature of the technology mm -hmm. um, and the important use cases that it can bring, not just to us, but of our member companies and support mm -hmm. those companies globally in, in trying to um, bring this to sort of the forefront and make everyone understand what it is. It's not for everyone, but I think eventually everyone will understand it and it'll be something like the web. We don't we don't talk about the web. It's like, you know, it's just there. It's there. Yeah, I think we're, technology. we're still getting to grips with us in many ways um, in terms of deciphering what it is, what it means, and what the applications are. Yeah. So all eyes will stay on, okay. on Dubai to see um, where, where things go. Um, returning um, to our, our virtual guests, um, I'll ask Juan Pablo and, and Carlos, you, you are leaders and heads of, of these important um, zones. What are your top priorities at the moment um, as we're in a kind of a strange moment as, as recovery starts to take hold, um, but you need to be, I guess, still kind of grappling with the crisis, but getting your plans in place to move beyond that? Um, as the president of, of, of Bogoshoff Free Zone, Juan Pablo, what are your top priorities at the moment? Thank you, Kearney. Well, we have been working very closely with our uh, Colombian promotion agency, ProColombia, and with the local promotion agencies in order to attract companies that are willing to be close to their clients due to the blockade and the shortage of the value chains that we have uh, had in the last few months due to the pandemic. So um, that's something that for us is very important because uh, that provides us uh, a lot of opportunities in order to attract uh, new investments with new technologies, uh, with new skills, uh, with new employments. Uh, so that's why 
with these agencies, we're working um, in order to attract the companies that are working with the 4.0 industry, with data centers, uh, particularly. Uh, we're very interested on, on that particular sector. We are at the moment um, under the construction of the, one of the biggest data centers in Colombia uh, that will have uh, around 12 megawatts of power uh, whenever it is finished and, and in, in full operation. Um, there are many uh, international companies, OTTs, interested on being, in being there. Um, and, and that's and, and that's because uh, Colombia has a, a very a very good uh, deployment of uh, telecommunications and very good a, a grid of energy, and uh, and the government is uh, um, willing to transform the grid uh, from what we have now uh, to uh, to a green energy in the next. Uh, 10 years, uh, by uh, 2030, we expect to have around uh, 25 or 30 percent of uh, our uh, energy uh, coming from uh, renewable powers, like uh, like the air, uh, eolic energy, or uh, photovoltaic energy. So that's something that is very important and is very interesting for this type of uh, businesses. Um, also, uh, we're looking uh, in order to uh, install, uh, and, this, and this is a, a joint venture alliance that we have with the Barcelona Free Zone uh, to install a, a 3D printing uh, entrepreneurship hub center in order to promote uh, this new technology in Colombia and in the region. We believe that this is something that is very important that is going to also give us uh, new skills and new capabilities in order to attract different uh, other uh, companies. Also, um, the e-commerce is something that is uh, a, a very active in Colombia. The growth of the of this sector is, has more than two digits already, and, 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 and there are plenty of these uh, uh, world players, global players, uh, installing their, their uh, the facilities in, 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 in Colombia and particularly in, in free zones. Uh, also, the agro-industry in Colombia is something that is growing very fast. Uh, our exports are growing uh, in, in a very important manner uh, coming from this sector. The, the agricultural um, in Colombia, the agriculture in Colombia is, is growing and, and, and giving us the opportunity to um, expand and to um, um, give us the opportunity to um, to have different sources of exports from 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 this uh, sector, particularly. Uh, so, for all of these, um, for the for the Bogota Free Trade Zone Group, it's very important to have new land spaces in order to attract and to uh, install these companies. That's why. We are uh, planning to have a, a, a new a additional area for the Bogota Free Zone mm -hmm. in one of the towns that are close to our free zone. There's a new regulation that allow us to have an additional area uh, in this particular uh, new, uh, cities around uh, the, the, the city of Bogota. So we're looking uh, for a space uh, of uh, 250,000 square meters around that in order to begin our expansion and also in the north part of the city. Uh, that particular um, uh, project uh, is a center on logistics and, and, and light industry, let's say. And we're looking for another space to have a more heavy industry uh, because in this particular area, we, we we're not allowed to have that. And also we're uh, going to uh, begin to work in parks uh, out of uh, the free zone regime that we believe that is something that uh, is important. Uh, there are many companies also willing to have that. We have many clients that uh, permanently are asking us to have a, an, an installation, but without the free zone regime because whatever reason. So uh, we're planning to develop these new three projects, uh, particularly in the next uh, months or year and a half or so, 
uh, all this uh, uh, covered by the ESG orientation and good practices, because we understand that uh, the environmental, the social, and the good government of these uh, new parks uh, are very important for the international uh, companies that are interested in, to invest in Colombia. So we have a, a lot of uh, activity. We believe that the best way to collaborate in order to reactivate our economies are continuing uh, the expansion, continuing investing in our country, um, trying to attract new investments uh, that brings uh, new skills, new technologies, uh, new opportunities for our communities and for our people. So um, that's what uh, has been uh, maintaining us uh, very busy in the last uh, few months uh, occurring. So uh, we're very uh, happy uh, to, to be so active uh, in these uh, projects, as I mentioned, and we expect to be successful with, with all of them. Well, it sounds like busy times um, for you indeed, but it's good that these new physical spaces are coming on stream to, to meet the demand and, course. and help provide the facilities that investors will need for the future. Carlos, I'd like to hear what's in your entry, what are your top priorities? And as Juan Pablo mentioned about ESG, and I know this is something that uh, Coil Free Zone has, has made a real central focus, ESG and sustainability. So. Um, what can you tell us about how that's driving your strategy going forward? Definitely, the sustainability is one of the most important objectives that we're moving. Costa Rica has created a strategy where we're talking about people, planet, and sustainability. So our goals is to continue expanding in businesses that improve the sustainability of the business in the future. And particularly, we're focusing in, in three main areas that are related to energy, related to mobility, related to digital services, pharmaceutical, and value-added services. What we're looking forward in terms of our strategy is to be much more sustainable, integrating particularly the digital uh, area of the academia. Some of the most important projects that we have are related to the new mobility systems where electric mobility, intelligent mobility will be in place, but also the digital way that the people learn is one of the most significant changes that we're looking forward to provide to our new uh, development. And also related to that, we're putting a center for medical innovations that we call the Costa Rica Center for Medical Innovation, which is a project that we're developing with the Georgia Center for Medical Innovation in order to start creating much more research and development in Costa Rica, much more pharma products. So with that in, 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 in vision, we are looking forward to take advantage into a new program that Costa Rica is putting in order to attract investments outside of what we call the central metropolitan area. In, in that regard, we're extending significantly our incentives in order to promote companies to go out of the central uh, valley. And we're putting a brand new free zone uh, located in that new area. There, we're expecting to build around 400,000 new square meters, and we're looking forward to create 22,000 new jobs in that new free zone within the following 15 years. So that way, we continue committed to the growth of Costa Rica. We continue to do more investments and more businesses based on the fact that around 70% of our customers has been expanding businesses with us and has been calling for new space to continue doing business in Costa Rica. So you're expanding to make room for all those companies that are expanding along with you. And 22,000 jobs, that's quite a big, um, I guess, am ambition or, or target. Do you think it's more difficult to create jobs in this current environment? I think it's going to be different. The way that the jobs are created is not only different in itself, but also the kind of jobs. What we're looking forward are jobs that are more related to high-end type of industry, particularly in services, particularly in high-end manufacturing, and some integrated 
processes where we're going to see new processes, not only medical devices, but also pharma and also advanced manufacturing processes. Great, then I'll return to um, James. What, where do you see the synergies and, and the level of interest? You're representing um, a, a Dubai entity in Europe. Um, how has the interest shifted or evolved post-COVID from what you're hearing from European investors, how they're viewing a place um, like Dubai and, and the broader Gulf? I think we've, all, we've always had a, a quite a broad remit geographically, you know, types of companies that come to us from what geographies. But I think that over the years, um, we've seen more activity coming from the US, South America, uh, and Asia in, in, in particular. Uh, we're open door policy for most activities. We started as a, as a very commodity centric um, with, a, with a mandate to create commodity trade flow through the region. So we had a, we had a sort of more of a narrow view on, on companies that were coming in, uh, in early days. But these days we have companies from all sectors and we support them equally. I don't think that during the COVID um, past 18 months and, and, for and longer, I don't think we've seen too much of a change in the demographic, geographic, de uh, geog geographic demographic. Um, but, uh, but Asia definitely has increased in volume. And I think that that's just by the very nature of what's happening and it may have happened even if COVID hadn't been thrown into the equation, what's happening in, in, in different countries. And I'd say going back to sort of looking at what you were talking about in terms of um, responsibility, I think DMCC has always been a leader in that, uh, in, in corporate social responsibility and instilling that in our members. And I think we were the first free zone or economic zone to work with the United Nations on, uh, on a policy for our member companies. In terms of job creation, I see that very much as a creation of corporate entities, so businesses. You can't have jobs without businesses, so it's our job to help businesses come into the region um, to lower the barrier um, to make it easier for businesses to just get on with business, to hire people, to have visas, for instance, longer visas, um, families easier to come into the region. Any number of these things makes it easier for people and um, those are employees of companies. So I feel that DMCC with its contribution of over 10% of the Dubai GDP mm -hmm. uh, and all the work we're doing on attracting businesses, which is now over 20,000 companies, it has that knock on effect of of creating jobs, if you like. And I think that the type of jobs and the type of company have changed. And mm -hmm. if you hear of people talking about it, like Elon Musk always talks about retraining, mm -hmm. it's just a natural th occurrence that we go through cycles mm -hmm. throughout history uh, where people need to be retrained. And this is the digital revolution where people will need to be trained and have different skill sets. And that may be disruptive, but I don't think it's avoidable. And I think it's positive. Yeah, and it, it fits with what Carlos was mentioning, that the, the job creation game, as it were, is just changing and evolving. And it yep. you still need to create those jobs, but they have to be the right kind of jobs that are fit for the future. Yeah, indeed. Um, um, Carlos and Juan Pablo, um, James mentioned about um, increased interest from Asia. And we do see some changing um, trade flows as well as FDI flows. In your zones in particular, do you see increased um, investment from Asia and are you increasing your engagement with Asian investors? Maybe Carlos first. Well, thank you, Courtney. I see the trend differently. Uh, what I see is a trend from American companies or European companies that were doing businesses in Asia that are moving and expanding the operations in Costa Rica in view of our closeness to United States markets. So that's what we call nearshoring. I mean, and that's a real trend for Costa Rica. And we're seeing a lot of companies looking forward to stall the operations in Costa Rica because it make it easy for them to work on the same timeline, to work on a location which is close to United States <clears throat> and a location that is still very competitive in terms of cost and operational uh, 
general uh, conditions. So that's what that's that's the trend that we're seeing. It's a, it's a little bit different. And Juan Pablo, what are you seeing there? How much engagement are you seeing and actual investment from Asia? I believe he might have frozen. Sorry. There we go. Um, yes, uh, we may have this some of the, uh, the same trends that Carlos uh, have said uh, has happened in, or is happening in, in Costa Rica. Uh, there are many companies from US and Europe that, as I mentioned before, due to the blockade and the shortage of the value chains, are willing to be closer to their to the clients or to, to their demand. So um, there is a huge opportunity for all the Caribbean, Central and Latin America, particularly for us that we have the largest cargo airport in Latin America, in El Dorado Airport in Bogota. Uh, we have uh, very good ports that has uh, many uh, uh, ships and, and, and connectivity coming from Asia, uh, from the Pacific or the Atlantic, give us the opportunity of uh, developing a, a very good strategy in order to attract these companies, bring their raw materials, produce here, and then export to America and the region. So this is something that is happening. There are many companies that are establishing in Colombia at the moment, uh, according to what ProColombia uh, has informed us uh, and what we have seen in, in, our, in our free zone and the free zones that we operate, there are more than 200 companies established in Colombia with uh, more than 1,500 uh, yes, uh, dollars uh, um, of investment. So it, it is something that is very important for us. But also, uh, I, I can say that uh, the the investment from Asia in Colombia has increased also a lot. Uh, the, some of the main infrastructure projects that we have had uh, deployed in Colombia uh, and invite investors from around the world has been taken or win by, by Asian uh, investments, like, for example, the Bogota Metro, uh, the, 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 the regional uh, metro from uh, the, let's say the the west uh, cities into Bogota, uh, that is called the Regio Tram. Also, uh, it's been uh, built and operated by by Chinese uh, investment. Um, some um, gold mining ha are being bought by by Chinese investment, um, and also some uh, roads, the the new roads that we call the 4G and 5G. Uh, are being uh, uh, developed by by, the, by Asian investment. So we we as as far as we have the the investment from North American and European companies looking for the markets in the north. Uh, also, the the investment uh, in infrastructure in Colombia is uh, is growing a lot in the last few months. Thank you. And you kind of bring our discussion full circle with the, the importance of Asian investment in supporting infrastructure development. And infrastructure development was something that, that both Carlos and Juan Pablo stressed early on in terms of helping to develop zones and improve um, connectivity. Um, you are all extremely busy gentlemen. Um, we can tell from the initiatives that you have, there's a lot going on, still a lot to do, but we thank you for taking the time to join us in person and virtually to share your thoughts and experiences. Wish you all much success in carrying these initiatives forward into the next year as we continue to recover. And thank you all for watching. So thank you, Courtney, thank you, Bernard, thank you, James Bernard, thank you, Pablo, Carlos, um, for estar aquí con nosotros y ofrecernos este panel. Uh, Courtney, we're going to let you rest. <laughs> thank you for all your work here, okay. and we'll see you tomorrow. Thank you. Ahora vamos a hacer una breve pausa y nos volvemos a encontrar a las tres en punto para abordar los aspectos legales de estas zonas económicas. Hasta ahora.